Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers for this uh, beautiful conference and for inviting me to give a talk. So uh, talks have been great so far, so there's quite some pressure on. I'll try to keep it up. Um, so I would like to talk about uh, joint work with uh, Mladen Besvin and Jing Tao, uh, which relates to the classification of mapping classes for surfaces of infinite type. So let me just start with the setup. I'm going to take a surface S um, that I'm just going to assume is connected. I'm always going to assume that it's orientable um, and that it has no boundary. And once I have such a surface, I can look at the mapping class group. We're already uh, seeing, I think, but it's just the group of orientation for serving homeomorphisms of the surface, which I consider up to homotopy. And the general goal is to classify its elements. Okay, so I want to classify homeomorphisms of surfaces up to wiggling. Um, and of course, uh, I guess most of us know that this has been done if uh, the surface, uh, if the fundamental group of the surface is finitely generated, and this is work of uh, Nielsen and Thurston, so we'll start with that um, to set up the notation and the viewpoint I would like to take. So I have a surface. I assume its fundamental group is finitely generated, and it is negative Euler characteristic. Then I pick an element of the mapping class group, and it's classified in the sense that there exists some representative homeomorphism in here, which is one of three types. Um, periodic, reducible, or pseudo-Nosov. Um, so periodic is possibly the simplest. It's just that there's some uh, power, so which is the identity. So this implies that phi is a finite order in the mapping class group, and, and it's actually equivalent. Um, reducible, that means that there is some collection gamma, um, some finite collection gamma of a simple closed um, essential curves, so essential just means that they don't bound a disk or a disk with at most one puncture. Uh, and I want them that they are pairwise disjoint. <coughs> and which is preserved by the map. And then the pseudonosov are the ones that we've already heard most about. So I'm going to recall the definition, even though the talk is mostly going to be about the non pseudonosov elements. So if you are not familiar or comfortable with them, <coughs> there's not a problem. So there exist two uh, foliations, two transverse foliations of the surface. Um, which are preserved by, which are fixed by F. And then F contracts and dilates, contracts one and dilates the other. Um, contracts, well, I say F plus, my factor. Lambda and uh, 
1 over lambda, say, and dilate f minus by a factor lambda. And the main thing I would want to, so the main thing for me about Suganosov elements is that one consequence of this is that the dynamics of the action of this element on the surface is very chaotic. So it has a complicated dynamics. And one way of seeing that is that if I take any two curves, um, my curves are always going to be uh, simple, closed, and essential. Uh, what I can do is I can look at the iterates of one, and I can see how many times these intersect the other. And I, look at, I can look at all of these numbers. And one way of saying that the dynamics is really chaotic is that this number, this collection of numbers is always unbounded. It's actually much stronger than this. But this, this means that if I look at any curve, it really goes everywhere in the surface and more and more. Um, and it turns out, this is a consequence of, of this theorem, is that this can be taken as an equivalent characterization of being Sudanasov. Um, very good. Um, so the way I would actually like to think about this is the following. What this theorem actually tells me is a way of constructing all elements of the mapping class group, starting from simple pieces and uh, understood maps. So I start with my surface. Say I have a surface here. Um, this, what this theorem tells me is that I can actually just split it into pieces, into simple pieces. Maybe there's going to be a subsurface here, and maybe some other subsurface here. And in, on each of these pieces, uh, the map, or maybe the first return map, is going to be one of two types. It's going to be periodic or pseudonosov. Say here it could be periodic, here it could be Pseudonosov, and here it could be Pseudonosov. Um, so, so, okay, so here I have my, my phi. So the point is, I start with my phi, and what I get is I get a simple decomposition, which is canonical, of the surface. And a list of prototype maps. And I can just look, put these prototype maps on these species, and I can glue them back to get any element. <coughs> and the fact Essentially, the fact that the decomposition is simple tells me that I can almost go back. I mean, there's up to Dane twists. Um, if I have the, the, the composition and I have the prototype maps, I can reconstruct any element of the mapping class group. And this is the kind of thing that I would like to have in general. Uh, for any surface whose fundamental group is not necessarily uh, finitely generated. <coughs> okay, let me recall another thing. Just uh, uh, equivalent conditions to being periodic. So a map is periodic. This is equivalent to saying that it's an isometry for some hyperbolic structure on the surface. Uh, 
Um, and it's equivalent to having a very simple dynamics in a sense, in the sense that this thing is really not true, meaning that actually every time that I pick two simple closed curves, every time that I look at the number of intersections of the iterates of one with the other, this collection of numbers is always bounded. Not uniformly, of course, it will depend on the, on the two curves I start with, but it's always bounded. OK, so the main question I want to try to answer today, or hint uh, at a start of an answer to, is what happens if I drop this assumption of the fundamental group being finitely generated? Um, and just to give you a couple of examples of surfaces that fit this framework, these are the surfaces that are usually called of infinite type. Uh, we could have surfaces of infinite genus, such as uh, something like this. We could uh, take a sphere and we could remove a counter set. Um, there's usually interested dynamicists, so I hope I'm, I'm drawing them in here. Or I can take uh, the plane and I can remove all points with integer coefficients. These are just some examples of, uh, of, infinite, of infinite type surfaces. There's many, many more. Um, but this is just to have an idea of which kind of surfaces we could be interested in. Okay. I forgot to bring that down. So in the surface, there is a unique Yeah. Ah, it's still there. Yeah, OK. <coughs> yeah, so topologically, um, topologically the, the, the space of ends, so say you have a, s a sphere and I remove something, it's only the topology of the thing that I'm removing that determines the surface. So, yeah. So there is a classification of surfaces of infinite type that use the, the space events, but it's not really important for what I'm going to say, so I wanted to pass on that. OK, so let me just uh, give a name to the elements that have these, um, this, this simple dynamics. I say that an element in the mapping class group is tame. If every time that I take two curves, uh, if I look at No, 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 okay, but if you remove an end set, um, so wh which, which in this case means a, a closed subset of a counter set. No, 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 I, I mean. So I call the element tame if every time I look at any two curves, this number is this collection of of numbers is bounded. So this is really going to tell me that if a map is tame, it doesn't have any pseudo of type behavior. Um, and in the finite type case, this really means that, uh, that uh, this is equivalent to being an isometry or being a periodic element. And so maybe the first question is, what happens if I look at these maps in the case of surfaces of infinite type? And um, it's easy to see that these equivalences are not true anymore. So let me just draw you, I'll just give you a couple of examples of tame maps. Well, first of all, I can look at periodic elements. Those are still tame. 
Um, but I can do more complicated things, or not very complicated yet, but uh, I take the surface um, and I look at the map, which uh, just shifts to the right by one. This is an example of a translation. So eventually, any curve will be translated away from any compact set. So this number will be bounded for any pairs of curves. Um, and I can do more complicated things. Say I have the plane and I remove two lines of points. Then what I can do is I can look at uh, top here. In the top part, I just do a shift in this direction. In the bottom part, I do a shift in the other direction. And then in the middle, I just do something to glue the two maps together. This is also going to be a tame map, um, which is neither of the two types that I've, uh, I've just drawn. Um, and so the remark that I was hinting at before is that if I have a periodic map, so some of these implications are true, but all the others all the, only in one direction all the time. So periodic implies uh, isometry for some um, hyperbolic metric. And isometry implies tame, but neither of the other implications are true. And so the example is, for instance, here, this translation can be realized by an isometry, but it's clearly not <coughs> periodic. Um, and this is an example of something that is tame, but there's no hyperbolic structure on the surface with respect to which this is an isometry. OK, so can we say what these elements are? Let me give you the theorem we have. It will be something not defined, and then... Uh, so it's, uh, it's the continuous, it's the image of a circle by a continuous map. Yeah, yeah. And, and I want them to be essential, so this is what I uh, wrote up there and didn't define. I just want them not to be contractible nor homotopic into uh, a puncture. No, it's definitely not closed. Yeah. No, no, it's a line. Um, OK, so the theorem that we have is this. I managed not to misspell the names of my co-authors, which would be nice to them. Um, OK, so I have phi an extra thing element. Okay, so this is the first thing that I owe you after the theorem. It's one of the things that I'll owe you after the theorem, telling you what this extra is and why it's there. Um, then what can I find? I can find some representative of this, this element, uh, a canonical decomposition of the surface into three subsurfaces and these subsurfaces are not necessarily connected and I can find a hyperbolic structure on the surface um, such that, so every time I take a component of my decomposition, so first thing, I actually go back to that. So there is a first return map, so there's some number which will depend on x. Um, such that x is sent to itself by 
the corresponding power of the, of the map. Um, and I can describe what the first return map is. So if I look at f of n on this subsurface, uh, this is homotopic to one of two possibility. Um, so it could either be um, a periodic isometry, so a finite order isometry. And this happens if x is in S per or S0. Uh, or it can be a translation, and in this case, it will also be realized by an isometry, so an isometric translation. If I'm in the other component, and so far S0 doesn't seem to have any specific difference from S per. So I'm going to add one sentence that tells us something about it, and then I'm going to make a couple of examples, give you a couple of examples that hopefully explain why we split that up. Uh, moreover, so S0 essentially doesn't have any interesting topology. So um, every component of S0 contains at most one essential curve. And if it does contain one, this one is actually peripheral. So it's uh, properly homotopic into a boundary component. OK, so let me just start by a couple of examples that Hopefully, we'll give you an idea of why we have this extra piece. And uh, um, and maybe, it, maybe first, somehow that this starts doing the thing that I want. I have a, I have a map, and I find a, a simple canonical decomposition and a list of prototype maps. And the fact that the decomposition is sufficiently simple allows me to essentially reconstruct uh, the map once I know this data. Um, so one example is this. It's maybe a bit ad hoc, but. Uh, Did you define no, that's uh, among the things that I'm going to do in a second. But before doing that, I just wanted to, to give a couple of examples that explain that. give you an idea of what this canonical decomposition is and why we have these specific pieces that are called S0. Why don't we just throw them into, um, into the periodic part? OK, so I have a surface here. That's the plane. I remove these two lines of, of punctures. And I also add uh, two handles. Um, what I can do is I can look at this strip. I'm going to give you the map. On this strip, I will do a translation. Let me call it uh, T. T1. And then I have on this strip, I'll do a translation S, and I'll just do the composition of these two. OK, and I do nothing outside. So this is an example of a tame map. Um, and I can find a decomposition like this. So what, what actually happens is that, um, that I want below, that the decomposition is going to be as follows. I have one line here. I have this. I have this. OK, so I have three lines and two curves that give me the decomposition. Uh, in this bit, the map is just going to be a, a translation, a shift. So I have this piece here, um, x, which is part 
of S infinity. And the same here. This is going to be just a shift. So why these two pieces give me S infinity. Um, these two pieces are just, in these two pieces, the map is periodic. A bit of a boring periodic map, but just the identity. So I have, let's say, uh, handle one and handle two. This gives me the periodic part. And then essentially I have some bits that are left and that I need to glue these pieces together. Um, so here I have um, something that looks like a half plane with a hole and the same here. So I have this uh, um, Z and W, these two bits here. These are the S0 part. Uh, and there's no curve in there, and that's essentially why we want to put these pieces on their own. Um, okay, so this is one example of a decomposition. And another example of a map that we've already seen, but not like this, is I can look at the matrix 2, 1, 1, 1. But this time, instead of acting on, on the quotient, of the plane mod z, mod z2, I act on the plane where I remove z2. Uh, this is a chain map. Um, and so on the plane, it needs, it's a, sorry, it's an extra chain map. So on the plane, there needs to be some decomposition like this. So let me try to draw it. Um, so it's something that can be computed. Uh, and the drawing won't be completely clear because the way the, the lines continue is not um, that easy to guess, but um, this is going to be harder than I thought. OK. Here. Then I want to pass below this and above this. OK. Then I want to go all the way in here. And then down there. OK, then I want to do this. This here, then um, yeah, then I want to go here. I think it's this. OK, uh, up to mistakes. Yep. Yeah, why what? Why is x given mapping to itself? Well, I mean, you can really just look at what happens. You can look at curves that are in there. So essentially what happens is that this, this subsurface x, um, you can look at it as the subsurface given by certain curves. And you see that all these curves go into, are sent to curves in the same collection. Can you explain again the I'm just looking, the map is the, is the um, is the composition of these two translations. Mm -hmm. And so the point, yeah, the point is maybe that <coughs> if you first look at it, it's a bit unclear how you, how you would get this decomposition. And by looking at, 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 at iterates of curves, you figure out that this is the decomposition that, that comes out of it. Yeah. So in particular, the diagonal is supposed to be invariant? Yeah. Yeah, in this case, uh, all the all the red lines that are the boundaries of the components of the decomposition are fixed. Um, this is not always the case, um, but I mean they can be permuted around. So it's also a periodic isometry. So actually, well, I mean, isometry is not maybe not very interested in that case, but it's just periodic, and uh, so these pieces are 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 essentially disks or little more with points removed from the boundary. And you just know that, that actually up to, they are fixed up to finite order. I, I might misunderstand the pictures. Is H1 and H2, are those handles? Yeah. Because it looks like it says S0 has it at most one simple closed curve. Uh, yeah, which is peripheral. But H1 and H2 are in S per. 
And S0 is just, um, so it has, it, topologically H, H1 is, is, a, is a closed disk. I remove one point from the boundary and one, uh, and one disk inside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And so here, what happens is something similar. I have one piece in the middle here, which is S zero, and then on all the other pieces, the map is actually a translation. After putting the 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 things in the correct order, all the other pieces, um, x one, x two x3 and x4, bad choice with the drawing of the points as x's. Uh, the xi's are components of s infinity. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I realize this is not a very surprising picture if you, once you think about it, but, um, uh, but it's, it's less obvious, I guess, at a first look that this can be split this way. Yeah? Uh, no, it's, it goes off in a, in a funny way. Um, so I don't, don't have the precise formula here of, of how it wiggles through things. But, uh, well, I mean, topologically, of course, you can move your punctures. If that, that's one possibility. If, you, if, you're, if you're OK with, uh, with putting the punctures in the correct way, you can choose those ones to be uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the metric can be put on. There's the, you can put some hyperbolic metric, but then everything is going to look quite different. OK, so I do owe you the definition of extra thing and, and, and the reason why that, that's there, um, which, uh, which is not because we couldn't just prove the theorem without that, but because the theorem is false without that hypothesis. OK, so extra thing. Um, also, apologies for the name. If anyone has better uh, ideas, then the paper's not published yet, so we can still change it. Um, sorry? Domesticated, yeah. We thought about a variety of things like this. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then, you know. <laughs> Here, we proved the theorem for the super simple maps. <laughs> OK, um, so I pick a curve. Um, what I can do is I can look at all of its iterates. So here I'm all cheating a little. Um, but this is a priori, it's just a mapping class. You just look at the, some representative. And what you actually want to look is at the geodesic representative of this with respect to some metric. But one way, but essentially what you want to say, you have this one, these things, these are subsets. This is a, as an infinite subset, a potentially infinite subset of the set of laminations. And you can think geodesic laminations on the surface. Um, so I have this set, and I can look at the accumulation points of this set. So this thing might accumulate on, on, on some lines, on some curves. On, on something complicated. Um, so this phi is any map. <coughs> so I can look at the, at the limit points or the accumulation points of the orbit. OK, and I look at all the things that I can get, and I call that the limit of the curve. So I say that L of alpha is the collection of all um, connected components of limits points in the orbit. Um, uh, 
Okay, so like if if this were just absolutely not of map, you would have some limit lamination, and you would just pick all the leaves, and you would put all the leaves in one set. Um, uh, here, let me just maybe draw this simple example. Uh, I can look at this curve, and if I iterate it, first iteration is going to be this, and so on. And so you see that in one direction, the limit is going to be just this horizontal line. Um, and so I put them all there, and I say that the map phi is extra tame if it's tame plus all of these sets are finite for any simple closed curve. So these are maps that they are supposed to, they're supposed to be already very simple and, and still to, to prove this result it took us quite a while. Um, Okay, let me maybe just say one remark. I'm saying another way why tame maps are really not Sudernosov. So what I was saying is, is if you have a Sudernosov map, when you look at limits of curves, you actually get very interesting objects. You get these interesting laminations. Um, and here you really don't, meaning that if phi is tame, then for every curve, this is just a union of either simple closed curves. This happens if, if, the, if the map is, if the curve is periodic, then the limit set is just going to be its, its orbit. Or properly embedded lines. Like in that example there. So there's really no interesting uh, limit points here. And this is also why one would start, or why we, would, we started looking at tame maps, because these are the ones for which there's no hope of having, um, of using some construction, at least uh, the Casson style construction, to find invariant laminations. So there's really no hope of, of getting anything that soon enough of like in this setup. Uh, yeah, so it's just, uh, okay, the, to simplify things, just fix a hyperbolic metric, otherwise we need to be a little more careful. Um, so you just fix a hyperbolic metric on your surface, uh, we're going to assume that it's uh, equal to its convex core. Um, and uh, I want a geodesic lamination to be a closed subset of the surface, which is just a union of pairwise disjoint uh, complete geodesics. So when you say the set Fn of alpha, you mean you take the geodesic yeah. representatives of each other? Yeah. I mean, of course, this thing can be turned into a fully topological uh, uh, result, meaning that if I take two hyperbolic structures, the result won't change. Um, I wanted to pass, skip that, put that under the rug. But the, the, to make this precise, the easiest way is just to fix a hyperbolic structure. Any more questions? Could you repeat the last thing you said, the laminations of closed subsets? So this okay, let me just write it down. So fix a hyperbolic structure. On S, uh, which is equal to X convex core. So I fix it X. This is a technical assumption. This means that the surface does not contain funnels or half planes. Um, otherwise, things are otherwise passing between different uh, hyperbolic structure might be complicated. Um, then a geodesic lamination. Uh, lambda on X is a closed subset of X, which is the union, the disjoint union, sorry, uh, 
of complete simple geodesics. Okay, so if you have never seen these before, uh, this does not tell you much. You can look at, you can think, for instance, at a bunch of simple closed uh, geodesics, but that's not a very interesting object. What I was hinting at is that geodesic laminations can be really complicated objects that go everywhere in the surface. Um, and so a union of just properly embedded disjoint um, geodesics is an example of a geodesic lamination, but it's a very simple example. Um, uh, so generically, a geodesic lamination has non-properly embedded uh, lines. And so, so the, what this is telling me is that if I have a tame, so even more an extra tame map, the limits of curves are simple objects. Okay, and so, and so what I'm doing there actually is that I'm looking at geodesic, if I'm fixing a hyperbolic structure, I'm looking at geodesic representatives, I look at those in the space of geodesic laminations, and I can define limits looking at the Hausdorff distance. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So, to mm, let me maybe remove those to see what goes wrong. Let me just give you um, a couple of ideas of the proof. What goes wrong, meaning why we need this extra tame assumption. So how can one prove this theorem? Let me go back to the, to the classical case. So say the fundamental group is finitely generated, so we want to have nielsen thurston's theorem. There's different, so this theorem has been proved in many, many ways. So there's different strategies one can look at. And the original one of Thurston's, um, you, you pick your element and you make it act on the Teichmuller space on the surface and actually on its uh, compactification. And then you, so th this is a nice object, this is just a closed ball of some finite dimension. And you can already say that there needs to be fixed points and then you can go on from that. So this is, uh, for instance, has been used by Thurston. Um, okay, this is one possibility. Then there's a, a strategy that was used by Kassen where you look at iterates of, of curves and you see what happens. So what, what he wants to do is you start with some curve, you, you assume your map is not periodic nor reducible, and you want to construct, well, in his case, first laminations, and you can go between laminations and foliations, but um, interesting limits. So you look at iterates of a curve and see where they accumulate. So look at iterates of curves. Um, and the third, uh, so it was, I think, what Nielsen first used, and Miller and Handel and Thurston. <coughs> um, what you can do is you have your map, and you look at the dynamics of the lifts of your map uh, to the boundary of the universal cover of the surface, which is just S1. Um, and what I wanted to say first is that the first approach doesn't seem to have a chance of working in our setup. And this is because if you have a surface of infinite type, uh, the Teichmuller space is of infinite dimension, which is already not that great. And if you also start adding um, uh, distances on it, 
it will be uh, disconnected, it will have uh, uncountably many connected components, neither of which is fetched, fixed by the mapping class group. And there's even, I think, elements that don't fix any connected component. So looking at the action of an element on this space doesn't seem to be the best way to go. Um, so what we tried is to use this approach. Um, would be interesting to see if that works too. And I think anyways, looking at the dynamics of the lifts will be useful at some point in the, what we hope to do in the future. But so what do we do here? Um, what I can do is, I, okay, I can look at what, what curves do. And I can split the curves. I can, I can look at special subsets of curves. I can look at the curves that are periodic. So I fix my, uh, my element that I want to classify. Um, and I can look at the curves that are periodic. This will give me some collection. And then I can look at the curves that are wandering. Um, so these are just curves so that every time I take a compact set, uh, there exists some n uh, sufficiently large so that if I look at, uh, let's say capital N, at the nth iterate of my curve and I, um, uh, is this joint have to homotopy from k. for every n, which is an absolute value bigger than this, this capital N. So this is the example of the curves in a translation. Um, if you iterate far enough, at some point you are away from every contact. And these are wandering curves. OK, so what you want to do, uh, you want to look at the pieces that contain these curves. Uh, and the, per the pieces that contain the periodic curves will give you the periodic pieces, and the pieces that contain the wandering curves will give you the translation pieces. Okay, so. So the first step essentially is this. is look at, so S per, which I'm going to say is the subsurface span by these curves. I'm going to tell you in a second what I mean by this. Um, and S infinity, the one spanned by the wandering curves. So this is essentially going to give us the two bits of the, of the decomposition, and then S0 is the rest. OK, so if you have this, um, it's not going to be very hard to show that the first, there's the first return map here, and that's going to be periodic. Uh, it takes a bit more work to show that there is a first return map to the components here, and the first return map is a is an isometric translation, but that's not surprising. And then you still need to show that there's no curves in the rest. Um, okay, this is great. The problem is, what is this, and does that exist? Okay, so I have key, see a collection of curves. Simple closed curves. My curves are always, I'm always assuming them simple, closed, and essential. Uh, then I want to say that the subsurface spanned by C is the smallest subsurface. Um, of, of S, uh, such that, well, two things happen. First of all, it needs to contain all the um, curves in C. Um, 
and the second thing is it's not much bigger than this. Meaning every time I have a curve, simple closed curve, in this subsurface, this essentially needs to come from my curves, meaning it's a finite concatenation of pieces of curves in C. Okay, so formally what I want to say is, mm, let's say I put all the curves, I realize all the curves in C as geodesics, and the curves that I can see in there up to homotopy are just things that I obtain by concatenating pieces of, of these curves. And, and why does that make sense? Um, because this, so this is the definition that co coincides with what we normally want for a subsurface span by a set of curves. Um, so how do I construct such a thing? Let me look at the example of a CA finite or locally finite collection of curves. Then what do I do? Um, then I can find the surface by taking the union of all of these curves. I take a little regular neighborhood. And then potentially there's some disks or one puncture disk in the, in the component, in, in the complement, and I fill them in. So this is the classical thing that people do. If you have a finite collection of curves, <coughs> you have a surface associated to that. OK, great. Uh, this works very well if the collection is finite or if it's locally finite. But in general, there's no such thing. OK, so here's just a very silly example. I take this collection of curves. And it goes on. And now I try to construct something that's, that's the smallest subsurface. So it will be the union of these annuli. But this union of annuli will accumulate somewhere. Uh, and I want my subsurface to be a closed subset. So well, I would want to take some closure. But then if I take the closure, it's not going to satisfy the right hypothesis. So the point is, this does not exist always if the connection of curves is infinite. And this is the main issue. And this is the thing that really can be fixed only if we add this extra tame assumption, meaning that there's tame but non extra tame maps for which the subsurface is spanned by. So if I look at periodic or wandering curves and I try to see if there's a subsurface spanned by them, this does not necessarily exist. Yeah? Uh, in connection with this equivalent to saying that like, an element has, in the Mackintosh group has infinite valence? Uh, uh, No, so, so here I'm really just, I'm forgetting for the moment about, uh, about mapping classes. I'm just really giving you a collection of curves. And I'm trying to say, because, so the collection of curves I'm interested in are collection of curves that come from the mapping class. But in general, well, I want to be able to define what is the subsurface given by um, some collection of curves and then apply it to these ones. And the problem is that, that this might go wrong. Um, OK, maybe the last thing I can do is give you an example of how things can go wrong. Of a tame, but not extra tame maps, map for which the decomposition um, cannot exist. And there, there cannot be a reasonable decomposition in, in subsurfaces um, as we would like. So it's in the plane. Okay. 
take a sequence of points at height 1, a sequence of points, same points, no, at height 0, then at I height a half, um, a third, well, you see how it's going, a fourth, okay, now I'm going to stop. You have the sequence of, uh, of uh, lines of points that I'm removing at height 1 over n. And then I'm also removing a, a u of points here. Then a u of points in between these two, but shifted further in. And then I go even further in, and I remove one here, and I remove all the way down. OK, so this is my surface. What is the map <coughs> on this horizontal piece? It's just going to be shift by 1. Same here. Same here. Same here. OK, and all the way down. So this needs to act as a shift by 1 on this line if, if I want to get uh, some continuous map. And then I break things by doing shifts like this in the U's. Okay, and then it's the I mean you taper it down to the identity outside. And now um, now what happens? What happens is that the curves, so there's no periodic curves, but the curves that are wandering are exactly those that are containing one of these yellow or red pieces. So what S infinity should be is the union of all of these pieces. But the union of all of these pieces is not a subsurface. Uh, so there's some they accumulate um, here. So there's no way I can just do something like this, this for a tame uh, map, which is not um, extra tame. There's another little issue, um, which is there's more maps that we might want to consider in general. Uh, like. Um, if, you, if you take a circle, you can look at the Dangeois rotation that, that fixes a Cantor set, and you, look, and you, look at, you can think of this circle as the equator of a sphere. So this gives me a map on the sphere. So this somehow should be a new map, but well, you can still hope to cut it into, into two pieces. But so, meaning that even if these two things exist, uh, this first step is, can fail because this could contain curves. Um, but I think this is really not the crucial issue. The crucial issue is that, in general, we won't have a subsurface decomposition. And so our goal is to try to describe what happens for the other cases, but I'm going to stop here. <laughs>